chose closer ties with Russia instead of the EU. That led to Viktor Yanukovych's downfall a few months later and a period of instability that opened the door to Russia's annexation of the Crimea. Well, joining me now is someone who was instrumental in those initial protests. Uh, uh, she is Alyashandra. Welcome uh, to you indeed. Uh, four years since uh, those protests started, uh, Yanukovych was ousted, yet Russia is in Crimea and uh, eastern Ukraine uh, as well. But there's a slight sense that the international community has turned its attention away from this, you know, that it's, it's stalemate. We accept it. Is that fair? I think it's definitely not fair because the war is still going on. It is an active war within Europe, although I understand that four years of um, incessant war is enough to make news uh, turn away. No, but do you think that the, it is now being neglected by... Um, I, it's definitely become less prominent on the agenda, yes. And what is, what is the uh, situation? I mean, how stable do you think, for example, uh, the Kiev government is? Well, uh, so far it's doing pretty well. It's adopting very uh, many needed reforms. Of course, it's not without problems, but that's how all politics works. Um, uh, the, of course, the reforms are not popular. The reforms um, and also the economic crisis that um, started after uh, Russia, Russia's start of Russian aggression in Ukraine, it led of, uh, to many people being disenchanted. And I understand them because life is difficult in Ukraine. And um, many reforms are also not being taken easily, like, for instance, um, with uh, tariffs. For a very long time, Ukraine has been on um, unsubsidized, living on subsidized gas from Russia, which was um, exchanged for political influence. We um, are stopping that. But of course, it leads to more spending on tariffs. So uh, all of this generates um, unpopularity with the current government, but at the same time, many reforms are being adopted. And as far as Crimea is concerned, I mean, that has been an act de facto. There's no, no chance, really, of that being reversed, is there? No, of course there's a chance of being reversed. We just need to stand firm and remind Russia that um, well, uh, this does in not place go. And they're not making a great difference. Uh, they are making a difference. Russia is losing economically. It is facing economic pressure. It is being diplomatically... No, I mean, I mean the, as far as uh, Crimea is concerned. Well, uh, is there any other way to go? I mean, do we just accept this violation of international norms? Well, if we I, do, I, then I mean, it the, opens the door to no, everything but, else. I mean, that's the point I'm trying to make. I mean, there, there is a kind of de facto acceptance that that has happened, isn't there? I mean, there's concern about eastern Ukraine, oh. but less of it. Not according to the international resolutions of the UN. I mean, it, Russia is officially declared an occupying state. So, uh, well, of course, the annexation has taken place. There's no denying that Russia is occupying Crimea, but it is an occupation and not anything else. And you're particularly concerned by the number of detainees the Russians have? I'm particularly concerned by the number of Ukrainian uh, political prisoners that are being fed into the Russian propaganda machine to generate its fake news that it uh, uses to demonize Ukrainians and drive its war. So what do you mean by that? By that I mean that a number of Ukrainian citizens are being used as, as essentially hostages that are being tortured into confessing into the wildest crimes. This is all being shown on Russian state TV um, to generate a narrative that it is not Russia who is the aggressor, it is actually Ukraine and the West that are out to get Russia. This is a very prominent narrative of Russian propaganda. And these are, these are what, people who've been captured these in are, prison? These are very different people. I mean, some just happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. The, one of the latest detainments is a teenager boy that went to met a girl in Belarus, and there he was kidnapped by Russian FSB, and is now going to be accused of terrorism based on his conversations with this girl on Skype. It's, it's, it's just ludicrous. And so you're saying what Russia is, is capturing people and then turning them into propaganda weapons? Yes. It's capturing live victims that it shows on propaganda to support its, its narrative, it support its propaganda narratives. And what can be done about that? Excuse me? What can be done about that? What can that? be done about that? Well, first of all, the problem has to be raised. This is an especially cynical approach of propaganda, just shutting people away to the, the longest 22 and a half years in jail. 
-hmm. based on uh, confession and quotes uh, from torture. It's wildest torture that people are going mad from it. And uh, this has to be talked about. Uh, this has to be raised internationally. I'm very happy for the latest EU resolution where 47 political prisoners are named and Russia is urged to release them. Um, but apart from that, uh, we have come to Britain to raise the issue of doing more, adopting uh, targeted sanctions for uh, the people who are responsible for ter torturing the people and perhaps setting up a platform to negotiate for their Because, I mean, there are a range of targeted sanctions already mm -hmm. in place. There are, but uh, not at the people who are responsible for kidnapping and torturing people uh, to extract these confessions. Now, we've got Boris Johnson going to uh, Russia, we understand, in the next few days. What do you think he should say to his Russian I think cabinet? he should show a picture of the political prisoners that are detained and ask Putin about the, here we go, 56 of them right here, yeah? Um, ask him what he thinks about that. And these were people who were detained how? They were kidnapped or? Some of them were kidnapped. Some were detained on administrative offenses and then the criminal offenses were slapped on them. Uh, many of them are Crimean Tatars. Almost half of them are Crimean Tatars that are being persecuted for de facto their ethnicity. They are all ethnic Muslims, and Russia is accusing them of being terrorists and extremists without any grounds whatsoever. And the FSB makes its careers in these cases, just sentencing dozens of people away in jail. More than a hundred children of Crimean Tatars right now are um, basically orphans. They are without fathers. And do you get any sense that the British government or the European uh, Union are going to do more about this? Well, we are seeing interest, actually, in our discussion in British Parliament yesterday. We have seen a lot of interest to this topic. So I think um, this is not even a question of justice for Ukrainians that have been illegally detained, but it's about making Russia a less authoritarian, less aggressive state, which would be a benef beneficial to whole humanity. Because these victims are its one of the most effective parts of the propaganda machine because they are living proof that it's not just some fables that the Russians are telling themselves, but they show these people, see, we have proof for you. Okay, Alexandra, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Time for